Buy your sled 66111 Skills for the rest of your life Bootstraps and probability It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your jam? Greetings with confidence, Bio6611. In this last lecture for week 7 on simple linear regression, we're going to speak about some practical considerations for the difference in estimation of confidence and prediction intervals. We'll first introduce the idea more generally before homing in on the context of a simple linear regression application. So prediction and estimation. We can think of this in two broad ways, one being the confidence interval we've previously talked about, and another being what we might call a reference range or a population level confidence interval. The reference range will be a description of the variability in the underlying population. Many times we're looking at that central 95%, usually estimated from some large sample of individuals that we believe are representative of the population. On the other hand, most often we work with confidence intervals. It's a description of the variability in our sample estimate of the true underlying mean or maybe some other population parameter such as a proportion, an odds ratio, or something else that we're trying to summarize. As just a very simple example not in a regression context, let's consider our FEV data set where we know that the mean FEV is 2.64 liters, the standard deviation is estimated to be 0.867, and we have a sample size of 654 adolescents from ages 3 to 19. Now you can pause the video here for a second and we're going to walk through the uh, questions on the slide here and their solutions. Okay, so let's walk through these questions and see how they connect back to topics we've previously discussed. Our first one is, what is the expected FEV for a single child, or just a Y hat that we're estimating? In other words, the estimated FEV for a single child, in this case just a single Y hat, we can note here it will be, based on the data we've been given, 2.64 liters. Because we haven't been given any predictors to look at a relationship in regression, the best we can estimate for any one child is that they will have the mean for the overall sample. Then we might want to say, well, what's the variability we have with this range? So for a single child, what might be the 95% reference range? And in this case, we would need to make an assumption that FEV is normally distributed because we're trying to describe the distribution for a single data point, y hat. So in this case, what we can note, though, is that we have our equations we've discussed previously where we can take y hat plus or minus um, our test statistic. We'll do our standard normal, a z at 0 0.975, and then we'll want to multiply that by our estimate of the variability of our y. So here we see we have 2.64 plus or minus 1.96 times 0.867. If we plug this in, we will get an estimated reference range of approximately 0.94 to 4.34. One thing to note here is that we're not looking at the mean FEV, just a single child's FEV. And so for that reason, we just use the estimated standard deviation instead of the standard error of the mean for our population, which we'll see here below. So now we have the question, well, what's the estimate of the true underlying mean for FEV in all children? Or in other words, what's our estimate of mu hat? Well, in this case, we know based on the data we've been given, it is also equal to 2.64 liters. We have no, again, predictors to use to say conditional on an x, what's the mean? And this represents what we saw previously, too, that if we have a distribution, for example, if we assume x is normally distributed with mean 2.64 and variance 8.67 squared, that the mean for both x and the sample mean x bar will both be 
Like before, though, we can now ask the question for our sample statistic of the underlying mean value, what's the 95% confidence interval? Well, in this case, we can reference back potentially to that x bar plus or minus. We'll just go ahead and put in our approximate 1.96 value now, and then we'll put in the standard error of x bar. We note that we'll have 2.64 plus or minus 1.96 times 0.867, our estimated standard deviation, divided by the square root of our sample size, 654, which will result in a 95% confidence interval of 2.57 up to 2.71. Again, this also represents what we've previously discussed with respect to the central limit theorem in that we have a tighter distribution when we're estimating the mean for a population rather than the reference range or the prediction interval for any one individual. And so with that background, let's turn our attention to how we can leverage these concepts and see them in action in simple linear regression. So in our regression context, we assume that the underlying mean changes according to the level of an explanatory variable or variables once we move into multiple linear regression. So we first have this idea that we're generally starting with is estimation. The expected mean or average mu for a given population value of x, say x naught, in the underlying population will be reflected by our predicted regression line or that fitted regression line where again we're looking at the average for a population given that x is equal to x naught. We can just plug then in x naught value, then multiply it by beta 1 hat, and add the intercept beta naught 0. Now what we could do, and we'll do later on uh, in a different lecture, is derive the property of how we get to this estimate of the variability. Um, but again, here we see that it's can be used by this formula that takes advantage of our mean square error or sigma squared hat y given x and also then a type of sums of squares type formula where our observed value or the value we want to evaluate this confidence interval at x naught minus the mean for x bar squared and then we'll divide it by the predicted or estimated variance for x. Now this will serve in contrast to the idea of prediction. Prediction is looking at the predicted value of y for a given value of x, say again x naught, for a randomly selected individual. This is very important here to note that we're no longer looking at the mean of a bunch of individuals, but we're saying for one randomly selected person from an underlying population, what do we predict their value will be? Now again, we can note, as we saw previously, we were discussing sort of the general properties um, outside the context of simple linear regression, we have the same way of calculating the mean. The expected value for an individual or an overall sample will be equivalent here. Um, in this case, we have then the standard error, which is given by the formula we see here, which is just that two components, one of the variance in estimating that uh, mean for y given x, but then adding in this additional term for the variance of the individual around the mean of y given x. And this is just an important thing to consider because we want to add that uncertainty for now that we have a random individual that could fall anywhere in our distribution versus a sample mean, which we know as we get a larger sample, the central limit theorem kicks in and starts to get a tighter and tighter um, distribution or a smaller standard error around that mean estimate. But we can use these formulas to actually calculate the confidence and prediction intervals in our context here for a simple linear regression. With those estimates of the standard error, we can calculate then what we call the confidence interval, which we've already seen, and the prediction interval. So again, the confidence interval describes the variability in the estimate of the underlying mean in the case of our simple linear regression, and it can be calculated without assuming the normality of the errors, and that's because when we're looking at the mean estimate, um, we have that central limit theorem that's essentially kicking into play. So even if we do have a violation where our normal, our errors are not precisely normally distributed, we can take some comfort in knowing the central limit theorem is doing its thing to help make our calculation 
of our 95% confidence interval, or whatever confidence level we wish, um, to be precise, or as precise as we can as our sample size increases. What we then see here as well, we can notice that we are using a t distribution instead of a z statistic or that standard normal distribution to account for the fact that, again, many times we're estimating um, the variability or that MSE from our sample itself. Now the confidence interval stands in contrast then to the prediction interval. So the prediction interval is like the reference range and it's going to describe the variability in the underlying population, not specifically the mean. It can be calculated if we assume that the errors are in fact normally distributed, because again here we have a sample size essentially of one in what we're trying to predict, using a very similar setup here where we take our estimate of the mean plus or minus um, some critical value here again using the t-distribution with n minus two degrees of freedom at that 97.5th percentile, and we'll plug in that standard error formula from the previous slide. What we'll see is that prediction intervals will be wider than confidence intervals since there is more variability around estimating an individual point as compared to the mean. So let's see an actual example here um, based on our FEV data again um, in children. So the first thing we can note here is that we do have some summary statistics uh, that we can use calculated from R. We can note at the top we have our sigma hat squared y given x or the estimate of our MSE. We can calculate the sum of our xi's or xi squareds. We can calculate the mean of our x's as well as the variance of our age from our sample. And these are all just quantities that we can leverage to plug into the equations we saw in the previous slides for doing a calculation by hand. So maybe take a second to jot these numbers down because we'll see them on the following slides in our actual calculation. So let's start by calculating the confidence interval. So let's say you were asked to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the underlying mean FEV among all children aged 16. First, we're going to calculate our mean. So again, we take our regression equation that we've seen throughout uh, the slide decks for our FEV and age. Um, so we have our intercept term of 0.43165, or the expected FEV if someone was zero years old, which again, in our context, both is troublesome because it extrapolates below our minimum age of three, but also it doesn't make a lot of biological sense. We then have our uh, beta one hat slope estimate for age of 0 0.22204, which says that for every one year increase in age, on average, we expect the FEV to increase by 0 0.222. Now for a 16 year old though, we can actually plug in that value for X get the calculation, we see that for a 16-year-old, we would on average expect the mean FEV to be 3.98 liters. We can then take our estimates from the previous slides, plug them into our formula, do a little mathy goodness, and we end up with an estimate here of approximately 0.05074 for the standard error of the mean FEV for a 16-year-old. With this information then, if we calculate what our critical statistic is at 654 minus 2, or 652 degrees of freedom, we see that with this large sample size, we basically have a value of 1.96 that we often use if we're assuming normality with the standard normal distribution. And we can then calculate the 95% confidence interval by using the equation previously. And we see that the 95% confidence interval for the underlying mean FEV is going to be 3.885 to 4.989. Or in other words, to put in the strict interpretation of a confidence interval, we are 95% confident that the true population mean for FEV among all children age 16 falls between 3.885 and 4.989 liters. Now, of course, this is looking at the mean FEV in a population, not the potential FEV for one individual. To do that, if we want to actually look at a randomly selected person who's aged to 16, we would need to calculate the prediction interval. 
So again, we'll follow a very similar set of steps where we will first calculate our mean, which again, we have the exact same equation, so we end up with the same predicted mean FEV for a 16-year-old, even if it's one individual, of 3.98 liters. We can then use our formula, which has, again, the same piece that we saw before, but with the addition of the MSE again to account for that individual variability in calculating the prediction interval. If we plug and chug those values, we now end up below with a much larger estimate of the standard error. Instead of about 0.05, it's 0.57. Again, then we can use that estimate of the standard error below here and plug that into our equation for our 95% prediction interval to get this much larger range of 2.867 to 5.101. We'll add our L for liters there for our units. So again, what this would be saying is that we are 95% confident that for a randomly selected individual, their FEV will fall between 2.867 and 5.101 liters for FEV if they're 16 years old. We note that that interval is much wider because we are trying to predict one person versus just the average FEV for all 16 year olds. I think it's helpful to visually see some of these relationships as well and note some other trends that can be uh, taken away from the data in general. So what we do see here is created in R, we have um, the overall sample of 654 observations. We see that the red line is going to represent the regression fit as we have age re uh, predicting FEV. And we see then that there's a very, very close purple line uh, for the 95% confidence interval here. We see that because we have such a large sample, we have a pretty narrow band for our 95% confidence interval or confidence band. This then stands in contrast if we then compare that to the width of our dashed blue line for the 95% prediction interval. Again, we can see here that almost all points, we could hypothesize approximately 95% of points, falls within this prediction interval because again, we're trying to predict for any individual with high confidence here, that they fall within that range. Now, one thing we can note is that if we had a smaller sample, for example, we take a random subsample of 25 at the right-hand side here, we see that the prediction interval for the most part isn't that much changed. It's still extremely wide. But what is different is that with a smaller sample, we have a much wider confidence interval in this case. And so the smaller sample size will more greatly impact the confidence interval width than the prediction interval width for any given value of age. We can also note that the change in slope will have a larger impact on the intervals, especially our confidence interval, at the extreme values of our distribution. For example, if we have a lower or higher age, we can see that the interval there is wider than it is towards the mean age where it's a little narrower. And that's because when x0 equals x bar, the standard error will be minimized. So again, just to conclude this lecture set, um, reiterating a few properties of prediction intervals and confidence intervals. What we'll see is that prediction intervals will be wider than confidence intervals, and we also need to note that we need to make an assumption of normality to calculate or believe we have an accurate confidence interval. Both prediction intervals and confidence intervals will be wider at the ends of the data because, again, the standard errors are at a minimum at their sample mean for the predictor x, um, x bar. But we will note also that prediction intervals, because they include that extra term for the MSE for that individual, will have less of a drastic effect, um, generally speaking, with this respect. They will be a little wider, but they're already so wide it's not always as apparent. We can note that confidence intervals will shrink considerably as the sample size grows because as we're trying to do inference on the mean of the sample and therefore the population, we have more confidence with a larger sample, whereas a prediction interval, of course, is always trying to look at the predicted value for one individual. And because of that, large samples are generally required if prediction intervals are to be used as reference ranges in practice. So for example, if we wanted to, in a clinic, um, actually say here is the predicted range for a uh, growth curve or some other quantity, we'd want to base that on a large sample to make sure we're catching as much variability um, as we possibly can. And so with that, we'll wrap up our lecture on prediction intervals and confidence intervals.
and next week we'll explore some of the derivations for some of the quantities that we've discussed this past week and stated as facts for formulas to use, um, but didn't discuss how we got there.